Well, I'd like to introduce you to State Representative Steve Hambly. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about him, and then we'll have a chance to meet him and speak more about uh, his plans for uh, running, running for re-election. Uh, State Representative Steve Hambly is serving his first term in the Ohio House of Representatives. He represents the 69th House District, which includes most of Medina County. Prior to being elected to the House, Hambly served as Medina County Commissioner for 18 years. He has also served as a Brunswick City Councilman for five years, chairing the City's Planning and Zoning Committee and Economic Development Committee. He received a PhD from the University of Akron in 1993 and was awarded a Martin Scholarship in History in two year, for two years. He retired from Lorain County Community College as an adjunct faculty uh, member in, 19, in 2014 in order to run and serve full-time in the Ohio House of Representatives. Over the last 20 years, as a professor teaching at various colleges, Dr. Hambly has taught courses in American national government, state and local government, introduction to politics, comparative politics, introduction to urban studies, contemporary world problems, history of civilization, and U.S. history. A lifelong resident of Medina County, Steve Hambly lives in Brunswick with his wife Cheryl. His stepson Josh, who was honorably discharged from the United States Marine Corps in 2013, lives in York Township with his wife Erica and seven-month-old daughter Alexi. Uh, so Steve Hambly, we'd like to welcome you here today. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you for coming out to uh, talk a little bit more about the coming elections and specifically about uh, the, your running for a position of state representative. Thank you. Uh, so first of all, for the viewers at home, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what the state representative does when they're in Columbus? Like, what, what's a typical day? What, mm -hmm. what kind of things do you do there? Well, it's, it's quite varied. Actually, a lot of, a lot of the work uh, doesn't happen in Columbus because I am a district representative. I, uh, I'm out in the district meeting with uh, not only businesses and constituents and going to events and so forth. Uh, when we're in session, uh, obviously, we, we are meeting uh, several times a year. We also have committees that are around there. So a typical day down in Columbus is you get in there early. Fortunately, I've got a, I bought a condo down in, in Guyana, and so I get there in very early. I find uh, if you get in around 7 o'clock, you beat all the Columbus traffic. Okay. Uh, and that they typically don't know how to drive down there during uh, during inclement weather when you've got fog or rain or snow it just slows down northeast ohio medina we're kind of used to it but right anyway so typically you, you you slug in there you right to work you've got various meetings uh we have uh, not only committee meetings but also you're, you also have various interests uh, people that want to sit down with you talk about legislation uh we have uh, in addition to the committees that, that meet you have then session and session uh, typically beforehand as a caucus where we're all sitting down and the Republican Party and of course the Democrats are sitting in theirs and we talk about what's on the agenda uh, for, for that particular session or that particular week okay. if we're meeting several days a week. And then uh, of course we go on the floor, we have our, uh, our the pomp and circumstance, we recognize uh, people from the state for uh, award, awards and, and, and great contributions to society in Ohio uh, and those kind of things and sometimes I, we've had occasionally people from the district uh, come down to be recognized okay. as well and then uh, we of course have the general business of the day and you go through the voting uh, uh, that, that occurs and afterwards uh, typically there's also meetings afterwards and committees and so a week is pretty busy usually we're uh, about when we're in session about three days a week uh, we've got between session and, and committee meetings okay. and you've got uh, various uh, activities in the evening where you're uh, I'll say to some socializing but a lot of it is just getting to know other representatives and other people uh, in the administration administration and, and those that uh, uh, will just say lobbyists are in the community that are interested in legislation that, that's uh, being worked on and in, in having an, uh, not only a time to sit down and chat but have a better understanding why people want what they want right uh, it's one thing to when somebody says why this is what I think needs to be done but understanding why was driving that and trying to really as a legislator is trying to find the root of the problem and see how you can contribute to solving that right issue. and how it affects like the broader community is it just this one person having this issue or is it a very broad-based issue for the state. Oh, exactly. And there's all, there's the checks and balances of the system. As as you mentioned, I was a commissioner for 18 years, and so really to get anything done under the statutes, I only need one other vote. So right. <laughs> that's that's pretty easy. Now, as a legislator, I need 50 votes, uh, 50 plus one, and I also need to get the Senate, which is 17, and then I have to have a governor go along with it. Right. So it's it's uh, very time-consuming. Much more of a uh, process. Uh, yeah. Much more of a process. And uh, there's the checks and balance of the system, and I, I have a joke that uh, oh, I, I said it frequently. And when I get, I retired from teaching, but when I go back to teaching, there's at least three or four lectures I'm changing on how state government operates. <laughs> a little bit more been, insight. Yeah, <laughs> now that you've been in the weeds. Oh yeah, indeed. Yeah. 
Um, well, tell us a little bit about why, why you're running uh, for re-election, and now, now you've had a chance to, uh, to be in this position for a few years. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell us about, now that you've, you've been in it, what makes you want to run, it, run for re-election and, and continue? Sure. Well, obviously, it's my, my own personal interest. I've, I've really enjoyed it, the opportunity to serve my community and my state, and I, I am humbled as, as, as well as appreciative of that opportunity to represent this district. Uh, and I'd like to continue to do that. But I think we've accomplished some significant things down there. Uh, I've been able to add a voice, if you will, uh, for local government, for, well, I'll just say local control. There's so much. The, the nature of a big government is that they just top on down. Mm -hmm. And I've always been an advocate, no, that you have to, the best decision is made closest to the problem. Right. And that means local government. That means local people. That means uh, allowing the businesses to, to resolve their issues and not the state mandating so many things. And we find that time and time again, too much at the state level, we have this kind of, well, we're we're the state, we know better, and this right. is the way it ought to be. And, and frankly, that is, uh, we can say in education, which is one of my key issues, where we've driven up the cost of education and lowered the quality just by the number of mandates and, and way of the you know, mandates that have been imposed upon local school districts. Right. So that's an opportunity to do that a I'm looking at. Thing, exactly. Yeah. I'm, I've co-sponsored House Bill uh, 2, 212, which actually hopes to return some of that uh, control back to the local, uh, local school board as well as the parents when it comes to curriculum and the assessments and even evaluating teachers and personnel that ought to be local that ought to be out of control not mandated by the state not over overseen so there's many of those things that really need to turn the tide I think where we've seen as I said increasing cost and lower quality right. uh, local government as, as I said as 18 years as commissioner I learned very very clearly that uh, with that decision at the local level that the states they can give us guidance and hopefully the, obviously provide financial assistance in many areas but we're best we're best when we're able to make those decisions and how okay. that money ought to be used. Um, I, I know that uh, at the state level, they're always looking at try to how do they attract and retain businesses to mm -hmm. the state of Ohio mm -hmm. and then to the, mm -hmm. our region in particular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what plans would you have, or what what can what can be done going forward to continue down that path of trying to retain businesses and and uh, attract new businesses? Well, this in this general assembly, the approach has been, and, and I've been there a year and nine months. So, uh, but we had a we had a tax. We, uh, you know, governor's budget included a lot of taxes, uh, changes, a lot of tax shifting, with the idea of reducing totally the income tax. I think, uh, and we. Had a tax uh, a tax review uh, commission, uh, 2020, make some recommendations and evaluating some of that. Where we, what I really think we need to do is, is obviously continue to reduce our income taxes uh, as we have. We did a 6.9% uh, across the board. We lowered the top rate, mm -hmm. but we need to. We've got nine tax brackets. And what we really did need to do is reduce that number and flatten it. So we need to right. reduce the number of brackets. I mean, that's that's uh, unbelievable. And not have a penalty for people that are working hard and doing a good job and earning more that we ought to take more of their money. Right. So we really need to flatten it. We need to, 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 to basically reduce those brackets. Uh, like, like, likewise, we had a proposal to increase the uh, commercial activity tax. We fought back against that. I would continue to fight against that. But certainly the commercial commercial activity tax, the idea that it would be low and broad, and that I continue to be that. Mm -hmm. Those are the kind of things the tax environment that the state needs to do. There's other areas where we've lowered the cost for uh, small business, for businesses actually to uh, create. Uh, we can reduce the fees by like 21%. Right. So that a new business coming in to file with the Secretary of State, uh, they actually will reduce the cost of actually starting that new business. Okay. Those are the kind of things that we in state government need to continue to do to reduce the costs of entrepreneurs going out there to provide the assistance and certainly give them the uh, if you will the resources uh, sometimes it's expertise we have a uh, an example we have a, a great corrosion center over at the university of akron and the state is involved in promoting that and for the we had a, a lot of federal money like millions of dollars that has been invested in the university of akron and there is no other corrosion uh, institution like that in in this part of the United States, right. and so businesses that are involved in manufacturing and industry that could use the benefit of that kind of research, yeah. the state is helping facilitate them to, to come in there. If they've got a program, they need to evaluate a coding and so forth to reduce that so their product lasts longer and they can be more competitive. Right. Those are the kind of things the state can best do: encourage and, and, and bring people together where we've got them the resources. Together, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Good examples. Um, 
What would be your top three priorities uh, if while in office should you get reelected? And in mm -hmm. fact, you'd already touched a little bit on uh, some ta business taxes and sure. education, and maybe yep. maybe those would be some of them. I'm not sure. Oh yeah, well, the, the, if you want to expand no, no, on that. Ta tax tax is still always an important issue that we're not going to raise them. That we can kind of we can move into a system that uh, basically distributes the burden and make sure that we are uh, capturing the revenues that we need to operate government, but mm -hmm. but actually hopefully reduce continue to reduce it with a growing economy. Second is uh, Certainly, uh, education. Continuing to fight for local public schools. Right. Uh, in our bill, we made uh, in our, our operating budget, we had uh, as enacted um, that no school lost funding. But there's the danger. There's an initiative at the state level uh, about readjusting that funding formula that actually is a detriment to our school districts. We're a wealthy county. Uh, there's no no secret there. And when you look at the formula, if you look at everything that, that our, our tax base and so forth, actually to the detriment, we don't receive really uh, adequate funding, I believe, from right. the state. And we ought to continue to fight any any erosion of, of that. But we also, as I pointed out, need to return a lot of that local control so we're not driving up the costs of education. Uh, charter school reform is another issue. Uh, we passed some in House Bill 2, uh, significant reforms and dealing with accountability and the reforms and oversight and making sure that we have transparency within uh, charter schools. They affect, uh, certainly dollar for dollar, they, they provide some quality education, but also there's some real problems. There's some bad charter schools out there. Those need to be eliminated. We need to do everything we can to make sure that this burden is not on the local taxpayer right. and that we can shift and, and change the funding. Right now it's a pass-through funding from the state that draws down a lot of local resources. And so, you mean uh, it's channeled to the charter it, schools? Exactly, yeah. exactly right. Now that follows the child, and you know, I, I looked uh, in the last thirty some years I've been a resident. I've paid probably sixty, seventy thousand dollars in property taxes. I've kind of estimated. And if I had a child, I would at least like to see some of that money go to benefit my child, even if I chose to take right. a charter school. So the question comes down to is what's a fair amount? of local resources. The parents that are paying taxes really ought to see some benefit from it. So right now I don't think it's a fair, equitable balance. I think there's an over-reliance upon the local, particularly wealthy counties like a wealthy district like ours. To help so fund it's an, it. Oh, yeah. Exactly. So the charter schools, they need to be reformed. I've got some bills involving uh, uh, residency verification. Right now the, the school boards brought, the school superintendents brought to me that the residency of a charter school uh, person attends that burden of determining the residency is upon the local public school, not the charter or the community school. And wow. so I've got a bill that I put in a couple months ago that says, no, that burden really ought to be on a charter or community school right. to determine the residency. Uh, one of the districts had uh, computers being sent to Wyoming, uh, which is, that's insane. Yeah. But it, how can the local school who never sees them know where know they're that. at? Yeah. So that ought to be the online school and the community school's responsibility. Needs to, yeah, figure uh, out how to do that. Well, exactly. And we have another, another bill I'm a co-sponsor of, House Bill 594, just introduced last week, actually. You know, if there's an audit funding with some of these char with these charter or community schools that are, uh, we'll, we'll just say, not living up to the terms of receiving public funding, and there's an audit funding and they return funds, do you know where that money goes? It goes back to the state it doesn't go back to the local school district. Ah. So House Bill 594, if I recall correctly, uh, that, that, that uh, requires that that money has to go back to the local to stay at the local Back level. to yes. the local district where it came from. So in other words, if there's an audit finding, that money has to go back from whence it came. Okay. And so th those are the areas that we need to continue to look at. And, and I'll, I'll just say, as a mechanic, you get in there, you got a problem with it, let's, let's fix it. Right. Uh, there is a need for, for, for charter schools. There is a need for community schools and allowing people to have options. But also there's some really, really bad ones that really need to reform, be removed, and we have to do everything we can to clean it up and make sure that it's not a drain on local taxpayers. Right, so that's just taking so, money and people aren't getting their value for money. Exactly yeah. right, exactly. Another area is opiate uh, addictions. Obviously, in, in, in our county, and our, our society, it is a growing problem. Uh, I, we certainly, at the state level, have started to address it, I think, in a somewhat comprehensive way. I think we're, at the state level, maybe a little bit behind what Medina County has been. Yeah. As a commissioner for 18 years, we had a Medina County Drug Abuse Commission right. where we emphasized education and enforcement and treatment, and that's always been kind of the three-part. At the state level, they didn't really, and these are local, we, we had 
used local resources for that. We provided enforcement, we provided education and, and for treatment. At the state level, not so much. They haven't done so much in education. Right. Uh, and actually there's a new task force that has been created to evaluate and look statewide to how the state can do more in terms of prevention and education. Yeah. So those are areas that, you know, Medina County, I think we're ahead, but it's still we've got the problem. Right. And at the state level, we need to help comprehensively deal not only increasing opportunities for treatment, but also dealing with the enforcement issues right. that are very complex and, 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 well, sometimes somewhat discouraging because of uh, how the issues that, are, that we've had to deal with. And then, and then third, of course, that we end up doing uh, the education component. Right. And that's a good example, too, of you mentioned earlier about mm -hmm. uh, local level be, being the, you know, a good place to make decisions because, uh, and, and you talked about how they kind of got out a little bit more ahead of the problem. Not that we don't have exactly. the problem as well, but at least it got more of a jump start versus yeah. at the state level. If you look at it as a percentage, we have a lower incidence of it, but we yeah. still have it's still far issue. too many than we, than, we, than we need to, than we ought, ought to. Uh, every, every, it's a tragedy. When you look about 70% of the opiate, as I understand the opiate addictions, I've been told, come, came by way of virtue of prescriptions. Right. The state, over the last number of years, the medical community has started to address that, that not the overprescription, and, yeah. and of course reducing the availability of it. And so those are the things that certainly need to continue to be done and focused on, but likewise we have to deal with those it is a chemical dependency issue. It is a brain chemistry issue. Yes. It's one that's going to require treatment. Uh, drug courts seem to be probably one of our best answers to it. Case Western Reserve University did, did a great follow-up study on the efficacy of those. Uh, these are people that had a, a, some kind of a criminal offense. They were brought into the court. They had a drug dependency. They were brought down from basically 100%. I mean, they're the criminals. Yeah. They brought down their recidivism rate is at 7%. In other words, 7% didn't return to crime after having a drug supervised treatment program. Okay. Likewise, their residency was something like 60%. In other words, they can maintain their residency. They also kept their jobs to the point of like 70%. So oh, okay. you have all these. Whether you have interaction, where you have uh, basically this kind of uh, uh, court-supervised activity with people that have committed crimes and have had these issues, and gives they an oversee that, gives them an opportunity, there's a great incidence of, of, of a cure rate. But yeah. it's not easy. It doesn't happen overnight. Right. And certainly the state needs, we need to focus on that and devote more resources in support of these uh, drug courts. Okay, good examples. Well, is there anything else that you'd like to uh, tell our viewers uh, about yourself or... or uh, the position you're running for that we didn't have a chance to talk about during the interview? Well, I, I, I think I've touched quite a bit. Obviously, I've, I've really in, in enjoyed the opportunity. I've put on about about 56,000 miles on my car <laughs> since uh, getting going down there, uh, and but about uh, about a, at least a dozen audio books. So I like to uh, keep educated. It's given me an opportunity, if that's called counts as reading. That's right. more reading than I've done in a long time. Yeah. But I, I don't do uh, uh, fiction. I do nonfiction and, and history primarily. So it's been able, at least academically, been able to keep my mind active. And I've enjoyed that opportunity. But what I what I really have have enjoyed is the interaction with people and seeing that the good work that we've done at the county level, the good work we've done at the state level, how much that really affects quality of life issues. Right. I was just over at the Badger Park. They just opened up over in, um, in Montville. Uh, we did a, yes. a ribbon cutting just a little just earlier this morning. Yes. And that came from virtue of a Clean Ohio grant. Now, when I was commissioner, I was involved with the local uh, committee that oversaw that. And, and one thing I pointed out in Montville, they had come my last year as the chairman of that organization, uh, the regional organization, where we made recommendations and they didn't qualify for the grant. But I met with them afterwards. I say, you know, if you tweak here, if you work here, and then they met with Tom James and, and we worked with them and just doggone if then they come back months later and come back and with a great proposal, they end wow. up getting the funding for that, yes. which provided a significant amount of funding. But the point was, is, is they didn't give up. Here's a great state program that they're, they're qualified to do. They work hard, and everybody collaboratively working together. You've got a number in the, within the community. If you look over there, the parking lot was about half the cost because yeah. of the local uh, local uh, contractor. You have, uh, uh, likewise, the people that were involved in the Blue Heron restaurant and, and so forth that purchased the property, worked a great deal with them to acquire those acres so that they could use that for a trail. So when you look at how it all works together, the state can't do it all, nor right. should they. 
But with those resources, they can be leveraged and people working together can be so successful. Change not only change our lives, but keep our quality of life in right. such a way that's special to Medina County. Certainly Montville's very proud, I mean, uh, of having that resource, but that's, I can cite example after example where I've seen that over the years of people, good people working together uh, and dealing with issues in a very constructive way. And yes, we have problems, but we've actually in moving forward so that not only our generation is benefiting, but the next several generations of Medina County likewise are benefiting from that collaboration. Great. And, and of course, and that's what makes us special. And my wife and I have walked through that park. It, it is very nice, and uh, we appreciate uh, the efforts of everyone who pu helped pull that together because we quite like it. Indeed. Uh, Steve Hamley, on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce from Medina, we would like to thank you for your time today and wish you luck in the upcoming election. All right. And thanks thank for you coming so much. down. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks. Daryl Kick has been married for over 22 years to his wife, Erin. She is a partner in a law firm of Kick and Gilman LLC with offices in Loudonville and Ashland. They have five children, Mariah uh, at MVNU, Jared at Cedarville U, Emma, Clarice, and Garrett at Kingsway Christian School near Orville, Ohio. They live near Loudonville, Ohio in Holmes County on a seventh generation, 400 acre working grain, beef, and hay family farm operation, Kicks Dairy Farm LLC. Daryl is the owner of investment properties through two companies, Mohican Rentals LLC and Westside Realty Management LLC, vacation and commercial resident and residential. He served on the Holmes County Farm Bureau Board for many years. Daryl was elected as president for four years served on a policy committee at the state level within the Farm Bureau, and several years as a delegate to the annual meeting representing Holmes County. Darrell was elected to the Loudonville Farmers Equity Board for nine years, eight years as board secretary. He served as deacon and treasurer at the Loudonville Baptist Temple, but is currently attending Ashland Calvary Baptist. Darrell is in his second term on the Kingsway Christian School Board, serving as board co-chair. He has been involved with youth coaching for many years, including softball, fifth and sixth grade boys basketball, assistant varsity boys basketball, and head coach girls varsity basketball. Darrell joined the staff of Congressman Bob Gibbs February 1st, 2011 as a field representative and is now part of the senior staff at his district director, as his district director based at Ashland, Ohio. Welcome this morning. Thank you. Good to be here. We have a few questions to go through. Uh, for the interviews at home, uh, can you start by describing what your role, what the role of the state representative is? Well, uh, very simply put, we uh, will be meeting with constituents and hearing from them as well and, and passing laws and figuring out ways to help make uh, jobs easier to be developed and, and uh, um, do the will of the people. Okay, very good. Um, can you introduce yourself and tell us a bit about why you are running? Well, I always thought I would someday. Um, kind of put off the political career uh, for many, many years and had the opportunity with Gibbs. Um, love to do this. I've just been always kind of bit by the bug of politics and, and uh, love being involved in it and meeting with people and hearing their concerns and seeing what we can do to help fix it. Uh, was. Uh, Working for the congressman, and uh, when Dave Hall's seat was determined, you know, he's open seat uh, because of his term limits, um, decided this might be the time for me to jump in. Very good. Very good. You have to be a people person to get out <laughs> and meet people. Um, how do we make the state more proactive to attract and retain business? Well, I personally believe it's to help government get out of the way whenever possible. Um, there are some good programs that uh, government can be a part of, especially with research and development. But I think uh, sometimes the regulations are so burdensome, it's, it's, uh, and some of the tax issues as well have been uh, just, it almost rejects business. And I want to help be a part of uh, making it simpler, um, a more uniform system. And uh, they've been doing great work down at the state um, the last several election cycles, and I'm looking forward to being a part of that. Keep the ball rolling yes. along. Very good. Uh, what are some of the challenges facing the state of Ohio during the term of office you are seeking? 
Well, one of the biggest is obviously our drug epidemic that we're uh, fighting, and I know the legislators are trying to do what they can to this point, and we'll continue to, uh, if elected, uh, I'll help be a part of continuing in that effort. Um, but jobs is still um, right up there well, and when you have the drug epidemic the way it is, that that hinders job uh, recipients as well, So, right. and it hurts business. Yeah. So yeah. Those are one of some of the biggest ones. Very good. Um, what will be your top three priorities while in office? Well, with an ag background, I'm very concerned about uh, property rights and, and uh, water quality issues, make sure it gets done right and not all the blames on one sector of the population. Um, education has been very important uh, to me and my wife. We, we went the Christian school route for Christian reasons, but um, with the funding issues and, and so many other avenues uh, with what comes down from higher above, if you will, from uh, the federal government and, sure. and sometimes the state, you want it to be mo more locally driven. So education is very important to me. Uh, the drug issue, like I mentioned, right. is extremely important. Um, the list. Uh, I'm, we're also licensed foster parents in the past, oh, so we haven't been here for a while, but uh, some of the social issues we're having with uh, our JFSs and, and uh, um, some of the other entities uh, want to help be a part of trying to make that system a little better too for families that are willing to take that step. Yeah, and sometimes that's uh, and part of the epidemic problem is then the family problems too. Yes. That yeah. all boils together. Mm -hmm. uh, school funding can continues to be an issue with the most recent uh, charter school funding as being in the headlines. Uh, do you see a solution to the issue in a reasonable time length of time? Well, this, this is uh, some of the funding issues have been a topic since I can remember, yeah. and uh, I don't. I'm not going to sit here and say that I have all the answers, but I'm sure looking forward to being part of the discussion. Sure. Uh, I know there's some good and bad that's been going on with the charter schools. Um, you can call it private school, Christian education. I'm involved in. Uh, it's very important to us, so I want to make sure those options are available, but not to hinder the public schools, and, and we just need to make sure education is going about the right way, right. and funding will, will follow. Fair and equitable. Very good. Uh, is there anything else you'd like the viewers to know? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to opening know. it up. Oh, wow. I'd <laughs> um, like for them to know. That's a good question. Uh -huh. I'm pretty open. I, I love to meet people, and I uh, love to hear their concerns. Um, the work that I've had with Congressman Gibbs has been an uh, instrumental part of my life to get me to this point, and um, my faith is strong. Um, I believe that God has opened doors for me to get to this point, so I believe I need to step through those doors and, and be that person for such a time as this. Very so. good. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to meet with us this morning. Well, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Very good. I'd like to introduce you to Larry Abhoff. Uh, Larry Abhoff is currently the state senator for the 22nd uh, Senate District, which includes Medina, Ashland, and Richland counties, as well as portions of Holmes County. He serves as the Senate President Pro Temper and is responsible for serving as the leader of the Senate in the absence of the state Senate President. Uh, senator Abhoff has sponsored legislation covering a wide range of issues, inclu including education, civil and criminal law, election administration, and taxation. He has been described by newspapers as someone who is instrumental in passing key bills and has earned a reputation as a lawmaker with a willingness to work across party lines. Senator Abhoff has received numerous honors in recognition of his work, including several Legislator of the Year awards. He has been named Watchdog of the Treasury by the United Conser Conservatives of Ohio and a Friend of Agriculture by the Ohio Farm Bureau Federation. In 2014, Senator Abhoff was named Legislator of the Year by the Public Children's Services Association of Ohio. He was named Guardian of Small Business by the National Federation of Independent Businesses in 2013 and received the Outstanding Legislator Award from the Ohio Society of CPAs in 2015 in recognition of his efforts to improve Ohio's economy. In addition to his legislative duties, Senator Abhoff is a practicing attorney and he has also served as an adjunct professor at the Case Western Reserve University School of Law. He has degrees from the Ohio State University and Yale Law School. Senator Abhoff resides in Medina with his wife, Nicole, and their three daughters. So welcome, Senator. Thank Thanks you for, for having coming me. today. Uh, so we'd like to talk a little bit about your background and plans for the future uh, should you get elected. 
So first, for our viewers at home, can you start just by describing a little bit about what the role of the state senator is? Sure. I represent Medina, Ashland, Richland, and parts of Holmes counties in the state Senate. Um, like Congress, the state legislature has two bodies, the uh, House of Representatives and the Senate. Uh, I currently serve as the president uh, pro tempore of the Senate, which means that uh, I'm responsible for leading the chamber when the Senate president isn't there. Uh, it's technically the second highest ranking position in the Senate. And uh, I work with all of my colleagues to develop our agenda uh, for every two-year cycle and um, help with a lot of different bills. So um, I sponsor bills myself, but then also play a significant background role in a lot of major policy initiatives. Okay, great. Thanks. Sounds like you're pretty busy. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background. We talked, you know, I read through the bio, but is there anything you want to add to that about your background in particular as you got into the Senate? Sure. Uh, I, I grew up on a farm here in northeastern Ohio and uh, um, attended Ohio State University and uh, when I graduated from law school I moved to Medina to be a law clerk for a federal judge here uh, Alice Batchelder she's actually the uh, the wife of the former Speaker of the House oh, yes. and, yeah. and longtime state representative uh, Bill Batchelder and uh, just loved the town so much that uh, that I kind of stuck around so uh, it's it's a great place and uh, I'm raising my family here um, I live in uh, Montville Township uh, uh, just down the road uh, from where we are now, and uh, I have three daughters under the age of 10. Okay, great. And uh, let's talk about a little bit about uh, business for a minute, uh, especially since here at the Chamber, that's what we're, we're trying to do is uh, help businesses grow. At the state level and, and in the Senate in particular, what, what can be done, what's been done recently and going in forward in the future, what can be done to make the state be proactive and attract and maintain, retain businesses? Well, that's a great question, and I think we've done a significant amount of work over the last five and a half years or so uh, since I joined the legislature and, and John Kasich became governor uh, to turn Ohio around. Um, we as a state had been hurting for a very long time. Uh, we lost about 350,000 net uh, private sector jobs during the recession and, and the four years uh, that Ted Strickland was governor and, uh, and really had been hurting for a number of years before that. I think the reasons were pretty obvious. Ohio had a very high uh, combined state and local taxation. Mm -hmm. uh, we had too many regulations, too much red tape getting in the way of small businesses. And our Department of Development, uh, the organization that was really um, responsible for helping businesses locate here or expand or, or trying to keep businesses here when they were thinking about moving, uh, it was run by politicians. And so some of the things that we've tried to do since, since 2011 uh, have been to cut taxes, um, get rid of unnecessary red tape and regulation, and, and put job uh, creation and job retention into the hands of people who've been successful in the private sector who really understand how those things work. Uh, so uh, to, to give you a couple of uh, numbers, uh, we've cut taxes by around $5 billion, uh, which is uh, among the highest of any state in the country during yeah, that span. That's good. Um, that includes significant across-the-board tax cuts for all Ohio taxpayers, uh, but it also includes uh, uh, small business tax relief designed to uh, help small businesses grow and expand and be able to reinvest and, and hire more people, uh, and eliminating the death tax um, so that uh, small businesses uh, it can be passed on through the family, that family farms, that uh, uh, people who've saved their entire life and want to provide a better future uh, for their children are able to do so. Um, we've changed the way we do regulations and uh, started doing a cost-benefit analysis and, and reviewing old regulations to see if uh, there are more um, effective, uh, streamlined ways to achieve our goals. And uh, because of that, we've seen about a 46% decrease in uh, net, 46% uh, decrease in new regulatory filings. So um, we're really working hard to get the red tape and regulation out of the way of small businesses. Okay, very good. And as a business owner myself, I can relate to the impact of regulations and taxes on businesses and how it can uh, hold them back. Well, uh, so I appreciate it. No problem. And, and just a, a couple of quick statistics. I think that uh, I think that what we're doing has been working pretty well. Um, Ohio has gone from being 47th or 48th in job creation, uh, you know, compared to all the other states, uh, to routinely being in the top 10. Uh, we've added about 438,000 net new private sector jobs uh, over the last five and a half years, so a significant improvement from where we were. 
and um, unemployment in the state has gone from uh, more than 9% to around 5% today. And I think in, in any given month in Medina, it's actually significantly lower than that, uh, maybe around 4.5%. So I think we're headed in the right direction. Um, that doesn't mean that our job is finished. It just means that we've got a good first step and that uh, over the next four years, uh, we need to build on that progress and, right. and continue the state's momentum. Okay. What will be your, t uh, you kind of talked about some of the things you're doing right now to, to help with businesses. Uh, overall, if, as going forward, if, should you get elected, what would be your top three priorities, say, in the next one to two years? Um, I think that the, uh, the top three priorities for me um, and, and what they have been over the last few years uh, have been improving uh, the economy um, so that uh, we can have not just uh, more jobs uh, in the state, but, uh, but better paying ones. I want everybody who, who wants to be able to find a job uh, to get one and, and one that's uh, good enough to support their family. Um, I think fighting the opioid epidemic and, and the heroin crisis is, is probably one of the most important things facing okay. not just uh, our state but our entire region. Right. Uh, we've seen a significant increase in the number of uh, overdoses over the years. Yeah, you read about it in the papers a lot. Yeah, and it's something that uh, doesn't care if you're rich or poor. Um, what your race is, where you're growing up, uh, you know, heroin is a problem everywhere, right. and it's uh, it's something that uh, we need to try to attack from all ends. And so, um, some of the things that we've done uh, on that front have been to try to improve uh, education and, and make sure that children understand that this isn't something that uh, that you can dabble in. It's not something that you can you can trifle with. You right. can't use heroin recreationally one time. Yeah, people get any, hooked. Anytime you do that, you're taking your life into your own hands. So we're trying to better educate people on the front end. Uh, we've done significant sentencing reforms to try to get uh, addicts um, community control sanctions and the treatment that they need. Um, and and we passed a number of bills expanding the availability of Narcan both to first responders and to friends and family members uh, so that if they can save them when they arrive on, on the scene. The yes. Emergency personnel, yeah. So so we're going to focus on that and, and do more to try to help on, on that front. Um, and then the, the other two issues that really stick out for me are uh, our education system uh, and uh, and our healthcare system. And, and with regard to education over the last few years, we've significantly increased uh, the money that the state is investing in uh, K through 12 education. And uh, we've tried to hold costs down at the higher education level uh, by freezing tuition uh, and uh, issuing what we call the Senate challenge to all of Ohio's uh, colleges and universities um, to cut the overall cost of attendance by 5%. Okay. Um, freezing tuition is fine, but if, uh, if you make up for it by increasing fees and other things, it doesn't help the bottom line for families that are struggling to pay for their, their children's education. Um, so, so we said, okay, taking everything into account, um, that's how we're going to do things from now on. Okay, great. And actually, that you were talking about education just now, and it's a good segue to my next question. And sure. that is, uh, talk about school funding. Uh, uh, I know it's been an issue, and, there, there, and you were talking a little bit about uh, that. And then also that charter school funding has been in the headlines. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts going forward on school funding and, and how charter schools fit in the picture? Sure. Well, on charter schools in general, I want to start by saying we have significant new regulations uh, that have gone into effect um, related to how they operate and and how they're ranked by the state and i was a co-sponsor of that legislation okay. it was house bill two um, and i'd invite anybody who's watching this to take a look at that and uh, call my office if you have any questions but uh, um, i i think that we'll see a significant improvement in in charter schools uh, and and the ones that uh, are operating well and that are doing their job i think frankly they welcome that kind of uh, opportunity right um, because i i think that those charter schools along with uh, uh, traditional schools um, they all agree that if you're not doing your job uh, then we you shouldn't be in the business of educating right. you don't children. Want a few bad apples to taint the exactly overall picture, exactly yeah. so I think overall you'll see a significant improvement uh, in charter schools in Ohio over the next few years um, as we weed out some of the ones that aren't uh, aren't really functioning the way that they're supposed to on the school funding front I think we've made pretty significant strides in the last few years um, we increased 
um, the state share of funding for K through 12 education by more than $700 million uh, two budget cycles ago, and I think by a similar number in this last budget. And uh, as we've as we've tried to change the formula um, to make it more fair and more equitable, uh, we've also emphasized, and the Senate in particular has emphasized, making sure that while you're improving some districts over here, you don't do that by taking money from from the districts over here. Right. Uh, so. We, I fought, I've personally fought pretty hard to make sure that no matter what budget formula we come out with, we ensure in every cycle that uh, each school district gets at least what they had before in terms of funding from the Don't state. Don't get shortchanged. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and I think we've made good progress on that. And as we move into the next General Assembly, what I'd like to see, and I talk to a lot of educators, I talk to uh, uh, superintendents pretty regularly, is I'd like to see more stability in the school funding system where we're not trying to reinvent the wheel every two years. We're not changing the formula. Give everyone a more predictable budget. I exactly. We, we want the schools to be able to look out five years into the future and say, okay, here are our costs, here are our expenses, uh, here's uh, our expected revenue. Um, let's budget accordingly when we decide how much staff to have, how many teachers to hire, those types of things. Well, if we're asking them to look out several years into the future, they should have some reason to believe that the budget's not going to change right. year after year and that they have a set that um, amount of funding that they can rely on. And so I fought pretty hard for that, and I'm going to continue to do that in the next General Assembly. Okay. Um, well, is there anything else that you would like to tell viewers that we didn't have a chance to talk about today? Sure. I, I think overall things in Ohio are improving and, uh, and have been for a few years. Uh, and again, and I, I think that's because we've tried to actually do the things that people say they're going to do on the campaign trail. We've cut taxes. We've gotten rid of unnecessary red tape and regulations. We've gotten government out of the way of job creators. Um, and we've tried to connect people who are looking for work with um, the opportunities that are available. Right. Um, I think most people would be stunned if they saw how many open jobs there are in Ohio at any given time, but it's right. upwards of 100,000 uh, positions. Um, and, and so I've sponsored legislation recently to help improve uh, the one-stop uh, um, website for, for finding those things, ohiomeansjobs.com. Yes. And, uh, and I, hopefully we're able to build on that kind of progress, too, to, to connect people with the uh, openings that there are, um, to help people improve their education, to get uh, the training necessary for the jobs that are going to be available in the future. Um, and, uh, and I think if you just take a look overall at, at how Ohio's economy has gone the last few years, uh, we're, we're headed in the right direction. Right. You know, you never want to take your foot off the gas. You, you want to keep working hard to make sure we keep moving in the right direction. But, uh, but I, I feel pretty good about the last five years. Right. Um, and I, um, we and are I can, on, oh, sorry, I can say I can relate to what you're talking about with the large number of job openings. And sometimes it's a matter of just finding, getting a, a good skill match and getting, getting folks uh, the right background so that they can get these open jobs. That's absolutely right, um, but but I think if you look again at uh, at where we are as a state, we're on pace this year to uh, break our record for the most number of new business formations in the state. And uh, I, I actually sponsored legislation to help make that happen by cutting our filing fee for starting a new business by around 21%. Uh, that makes us the uh, the most affordable state in the Midwest to start and maintain a new business. Oh, okay. And um, you know, while the filing fee itself might not be something that makes somebody decide, I'm going to do business in Ohio, um, when you start to tack on all of these other things, uh, lower taxes, uh, less regulation, um, being, you know, more hospitable as a marketplace in general, uh, now cutting the filing fees, improving OhioMeansJobs.com, those things really start to add up. And uh, and that becomes the, the entire... Uh, um, um, basket of things that employers are, are looking for right. or that establishing business, the right climate yes yes and I, and I think that establishing the right business climate um, is really how you lead to, to more long-term sustained economic growth particularly in small businesses and that's that's really the backbone of our economy okay well Senator Abha thank you very much for coming well, thanks, out today and thank for, you for uh, having speaking me. to our viewers uh, about the upcoming elections and what you're doing in the Senate thank you thank you Thank you.